Hi, and welcome to a Small, Medium, at Large podcast. I'm your host, Gail Heisen, bringing you intimate interviews beyond normal boundaries. I want to thank all you listeners who've subscribed, and I want to encourage any of you who haven't yet to please subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can also find us on Spotify, Google Podcasts, and other podcast social media sites. I want to thank my children, Richard and Nancy, for posting and uh, uh, making this, this, this podcast possible for all of us. So thank you to them as well. And I want to tell you today about our special guest. Our special guest today is Cynthia Sue Larson. Cynthia Sue Larson is the best-selling author of several books, some of which I'll mention here, The Mandela Effect and Its Society, Quantum Jumps, Reality Shifts, and High Energy Money. In her newest book, Mandela Effect and Its Society, she shares indigenous wisdom to quantum science to firsthand reports. She describes the Mandela effect as much more than false collective memory. She shares its history, science, language, and exercises as well. Cynthia shows how to harness our natural quantum superpowers and wisely choose the reality we need. Cynthia shows how to harness, um, excuse me, Cynthia has a degree in physics from UC Berkeley, an MBA degree, a doctor of divinity, and a second degree black belt. Cynthia is founder of Reality Shifters, Reality Shifters, first president of the International Mandela Effect Conference, managing director of Foundations of Mind, and creator and host of Living the Quantum Dream podcast. She has featured in she has been featured in numerous shows, including Gaia, The History Channel, Coast to Coast AM, and the BBC. Subscribe to her free monthly e-zine at her realityshifters.com website. Capital R, lowercase E A L I T Y, capital S H lowercase I F T E R S dot com website. Cynthia reminds us to ask in every situation, how good can it get? So let's watch, let's welcome Cynthia here today. Hi, Cynthia. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank uh, you. I, 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 <laughs> I'm just getting over COVID, so I'm a little bit, a little bit, not 100% yet, but I'm trying to do my best. <laughs> <laughs> We've got so much great inner spirit that just shines forth, so you're a powerhouse. <laughs> uh, so pardon my couple of little uh, errors there, but let's begin with the first question I like to ask uh, all my guests, which is, where and what was it like growing up in your family? And was it that's when your spiritual journey started or did it happen later in life because of an event or a trauma or an encounter with a spiritual teacher? Yeah, it did start early. I'm the first of two children and I grew up in Carmichael, California near Sacramento. It's just a suburb. So my mother was a school teacher. My father is an engineer. It seemed like a very normal family, and I think it is pretty normal. I mean, sure, they've got their idiosyncrasies, but not what I'd call spiritual exactly. But I've always been really a spiritual child and aware of energies, looking at energies, feeling them, sensing them. So we would travel to remote places in the world. That was an idiosyncrasy, a cool one. So we'd go to places where they'd never seen Caucasians or white people. And I, I just love the energies. I love the feeling of connecting with the land, the people, the animals. And, and when I was home in our little suburban yard, I'd usually climb a tree. Um, even if I'm reading a book, climb a tree, bring the book, you know. <laughs> I liked, um, just I just love nature, obviously. So to me, that's a big part of spirituality. The other interesting aspect is I'm, there's something called Born Aware. Diane Brandon wrote a book about it. And I've got a chapter, the Whoops, Wrong Planet chapter which was feeling like this place isn't quite what, well, it's not quite as good as when I'm between lives. And I, I actually did remember that. So I was um, feeling a lot of PTSD from having, um, I think I'd gone forward to check out, let's check out the possible future where AI runs everything. Let's see how that works. So that was my most recent past life. Boy, was that uh, what I'd call not a good one. Let's not go there. <laughs> I, <laughs> like I went there 
it's a big mistake. Let's not do it. And then I came back. But in the meantime, I felt like I needed a lot of R&R &R, and I didn't quite get all that R&R. &R. So I just came into this life. Now I get it. Now I know why I remember so much of that past life in the future, 500 years from now. Because it's now it doesn't look that far away. Now it looks like, oh my goodness. So that so, really has motivated me all my life. This, um, you know, getting back to the earth, the connections. We were talking about Zurich Bittar <laughs> before <laughs> this started. And of course I mentioned him in my book. If people don't know who that is, wow, they should from listening to you. So anyway. you say that uh, growing up that you travel to uh different areas in the world where you found yourself being like the only white person there or yes. where, what was it your parents work or was it that we they just wanted you to explain wanted to explore the world and their children yes. got to go in and that's a that's a fantastic child yes. to have to be so magical to other cultures was yes. there any country or place that hit you the most intense where you felt like that had been a place you had been there before um, not really. Um, the place that I feel like I've been before is actually California, like the, the California coastline. That was my where I was in the past life and the future. I suspect I have what you might call star seed um, soul fragments. I'm, I'm like a mutt. I think I'm a, an amalgamate of various um, things. I needed to have that so that I could survive the past life and the future, jump back in time to here. So I love Japan. It felt like peaceful. When I was in Japan in the 1970s, I felt like, oh, bliss. Because people would understand that you want silence. They'd understand that you're focusing on nature. They get it. And but this, you could hear a pin drop. It was like, perfect. I just loved that. So for, for my sensibility and sensitivity, it was beautiful. But I, I love um, loved Bali, Indonesia. That, that, of course, has all kinds of people. Uh, yes. Remote places in Africa were amazing to see the stars. And to, to meet the Dogon people and to hear about, um, I didn't understand, I didn't understand their language. So we'd have a guide, but um, it was amazing just to meet these people, these amazing Maasai warriors. We picked one up who was hitchhiking and he didn't really fit in the car. They're very big people. <laughs> Even my sister and I are tiny, but he had his spear and everything. And it was like the Maasai. And then we're sort of, the two of my sister and I cramped over to the other side, you know, just like very silent, like <laughs> It was an amazing experience there too. And driving where there were no roads, just if it rains, you've got to keep moving because it gets stuck in the mud. No roads, no traffic. It was extraordinary. What an extraordinary and wonderful uh, childhood to grow up that way. And also all the things that you consciously and unconsciously absorbed in being with all those different cultures. Something that I've always been asking some of the scientists lately is, can you do an experiment where you explain how could someone like myself, or maybe someone like Cynthia, uh, who's had these deep connections with people in other cultures, how we communicate completely with words in our telepathic connection when neither of us speaks each other's language. And we understand when I received my um, uh, shamanic Mongolian initiation from Zagda, I was her 63rd initiation. Hmm. We spent six days with no translator completely. She would just think in her mind of something she wanted. And I'd come running down with an herb from Siberia someone had given me years before. And she'd say, <laughs> ah, and we would communicate back and forth. When I was in the Japanese culture, the same thing happened. When I've been in the Wichol culture, the same thing happened. So that means we're telepathically communicating with yes. something other than words. Yes. But I haven't seen a, an experiment about this. And um, when I spoke to Dean Radin about it once, he said, well, a lot of these things have to do with money and funding and you know, yes. to find someone who would want to support such a thing. But I feel like mentioning it because I think it would be an interesting study on how do we telepathically really communicate when we know they don't speak English and I don't speak Wichol or I don't speak Mongolian. So I'd like to know how did that happen? I don't have the answer, but I just know <laughs> that it happens. <laughs> it does. It's funny so, you mentioned Dean Radin because I've been participating, or this year earlier, I was part of this new experiment he's doing. So he does top drawer research. Is that just, the sigil experiment? Yes. You too? 
Yes. Oh, yeah. Here's my little box right here. Yes. Got the little box. <laughs> yes. Mine's in the other room. I don't have it to show. Are we talking about that experiment? I'm going to publicize it at the conference in November in Nashville because I want people to know a little bit about what's behind the experiment. And he's, as you know, he's so so organized. He's already got preliminary results. They're better than most people's final results. But then he's saying, I will have the final. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's like Christmas for me. I'm just so happy. I I didn't know about the experiment. And as it was closed, he contacted me and asked if I would like to participate. And I yes. said, yes, yes, yes. And yes. I asked if I could keep the box because I find it is like a teaching tool. I kept mine too. Yeah, I love it. I love mine got, it. My, mine's got the, um, I think a copper kind of coil. So it's like a Faraday cage around mine. Oh. It's so sweet. It's so beautiful. But it looks just like yours. It's the same thing. It, it's just, you know, when you cage something, then there should be no effect. Ah. <laughs> and well, I you did, and I both know. No, I, no problem. No problem. I didn't have success getting the light to turn white until after I did it three times. Because yeah, I couldn't get the figure out right? what am I supposed to do? So for, then, we, maybe we should explain what this was. This was yes. Uh, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> well, he's working with an interferometer, which is very similar to the little slit experiment. So it's like the closest thing you can get. Put it inside a little box. So Dean Radin is chief scientist, as people know, at Institute of Noah Sciences Ions, and so he came up, designed an experiment, got funding, and um, he went on a worldwide search to find people that would qualify. He knows you qualify. Um, but but a lot of people, uh, myself included, cleared by taking attention tests to show that we can hold our attention. He was looking for magical practitioners, meditators, martial artists, if they do that, um, but, but basically to find people that can really focus. And the idea was to focus so, like you said, on something that we've not done before, to influence the inner workings of an interferometer where a little photon of light can be interfering with itself thanks to, in this case, uh, electronic circuitry. Sometimes such a de experimental design might include a mirror where you could kind of have a like a photon bounce off a mirror and inter interfere with itself that way. In this experiment, all of the electronics handle that. And so there would be um, the, the test, the, what do you call it, uh, runs where it's not um, man monitored or influenced by one of us. And so, Dean would just run the little box by itself and notice, okay, this then would be the control group. You can see left to its own devices, there's sort of this random kind of a thing going on. With one of us working with it, he was expecting and did see good results where we were able to influence the uh, interference of light within the box, even if it's covered with copper foil. I knew what uh, that was when I saw it. I'm like, yeah, bring it. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> bring it on. <laughs> Well, the thing I found interesting about it was seeing when my energy was a certain way that there was all I could get was the white light, which was what the tar the task was to yes. make a bright white light on the box and not the other colors that come up, green and red and um, blue. And uh, once I figured out how to sort of direct my energy in that way, and I did it by contacting the deceased spirit of Jean Millay, because Aww. Jean Millay loved the light and all yes. the things were about the light. And she had her chart I have up on the wall here about light. And I said to her, Jean, I'm trying to get this experiment to work. I need light, white light. The minute I did this connection with her, that's all I could get for the next three times was just solid white the whole time, never another color. So then I yeah. thought machine maybe was broken. And I had done something wrong. So I said, well, I'm going to do it again. And I'm going to contact someone else or do something else. And mm -hmm. sure enough, I got green and blues mm -hmm. and I couldn't get the white. And I didn't really want to give, you know, ne negative data, but I really right. wanted to prove to myself that it was really working. And so it's a machine that gives back to the participant an immediate result. And I find that that's what encourages me to do better. Yes. Yeah. So and it's really a great example of mind matter interaction that we can influence things with our consciousness, which many of us know, of course, you're a shaman. And those of us who do these practices with clients, like, like I do, 
you know, we're, we're, we keep our hand in at it. Seldom do we get something like a machine that can give you that kind of feedback. Like okay. you said, that's so amazing. And it's very... I learned something a weird experience with it because I was doing quite well. I did a couple practice runs and then all the regular runs were pretty good until I thought, well, let's try to make it super, super good. Like have it be like full white all the time. So I thought I'll just, um, I was basically running Kundalini energy first. It was a big mistake because by the time, then when I went in to do the, like, okay, I've been meditating, I got the Kundalini up, that should have been a test run, but I felt very cocky and confident. Well, I'll just take go. Ha. Well, it did not work out so well. Very funny. So, but, it, but then I learned something that in the real world, like you and I know, you get your best results when you need the best results, when it's in that moment. That's when I see straight out miracles quite often. Well, not not every time, but I've seen so many that are inexplicable by any standard means. And I do explain, I share some of them in, in this book that I just wrote to some off the yes. wall, crazy stuff. <laughs> I, I didn't mean for us to go deviate on our, we're going to go back we're to having the some... stellar effect uh, and my questions regarding that. I, I just want to add that I noted also that um, George Weissman was in your uh, and mm -hmm. I have just been connected to him from oh. uh, uh, Russell Targ. Yes. And uh, it was a, an experiment where it's a telekinesis and he wants you to twirl the paper I have back there in that glass jar. And it's suspended on a spider thread, spider spider web, right? Um, I, <laughs> puts them together. I, so That's I, what, it, spider what I did is I said to myself, you know, if I do good on the Dean thing, then I'll yeah. rush over and do the the uh, telekinesis. And sure enough, when I do a very high white light experience with Dean's box, and then I yes. go over and I'm in that same focus yes. space, I was able to, it took me also three times, I couldn't get the paper to twirl. But when mm -hmm. it finally twirled, because I had never done anything like this before, where you're not touching the object. Right. Three times in a row, I was able to get it to twirl around to the, and I was like in amazement that this could actually occur without physically touching something. So yes. they, it's really great to have that, knowing that both you and I have uh, these wonderful mentor, mentors in our life that have <laughs> encouraged us in these wonderful experiments. So now before I, yeah, when I met George with all, he has, if you go to his place, he has just a whole room filled with these bell, like bell jars with the little spider thread and a paper spiral inside. And I, when I used to teach workshops 25 years ago, I would make these little, um, like you can take a pie tin and balance it, um, cut off a little, like it looks like a propeller uh, shape, balance it on a pin, put it inside a plastic box. And I, I made one for every student in the workshop. Wow. So we do cloud busting. We do spinning of these little things. It's easier, I think, than trying to find the, those nice big bell jars like what George has. They're beautiful. Um, maybe if you go to thrift stores enough, you can find them. But they can break, too. I like these little ones because you can put them in a suitcase and bring them to something. That's a, <laughs> that's a very nice idea because the one I have is huge. But yeah. he had given me specifications of how high he wanted it and how long yes. the silk thread had to be. And yes. uh, so I followed it all. But then I lose. And I didn't know that I could do this either. It was not something I'd ever done before. But it was something that when he spoke to Russell, Russell said, call Gail. Yes. I had never met him until recently this last year. But what a wonderful man. So oh, it's so great wonderful. that you've known him for such a long time. Met him in 2013 on the book tour for Quantum Jumps. I was there with Eva her um she put together a book tour with me in portland which is where we met george and then we went on to seattle so that was our big book tour she's passed on now but she's still with me in my heart too and yes she knew george so that's how i met him and he picked us up at the airport uh, that was a funny story because when I'd, I'd never met eva in person so she's on the phone with george and i'm I suddenly feel like um go to the luggage um where it's about to drop something so i had a, i sort of waved and I indicated I'm pointed where I'm going. I didn't know why. I, I didn't have a carry. I only had carry on luggage. So, but I know to follow these intuitive nudges. So I just walk. And then at, just as I arrive where the luggage is dropping, then the next very next bag, I knew, I just knew that's hers. So I, I looked at her and she's busy on the phone. So I just take the bag and I'm holding it and I show it to her, point at it. And her jaw just goes. <laughs> It's a very busy airport, very busy baggage terminal. But you know, when you know, you know. And I had that right. energy. It's what you're talking about—that energy, and that knowing. 
And it also ties in with what you said, like how can we talk to each other when we're not just talking the same language and understand each other? Well, there we are again. So this is this is part of life, you know, for us. Uh, yes. Part of life with our quantum superpowers, which I, I do like <laughs> to talk about. So I want to go towards to, to questions about our book now, but I'm really glad that we got to catch up on uh, how our people are doing and the experiments we're in. I... I have to say that until I received your book, I have never heard of the Mandela effect. So I kind of want to start with the first question being, can you explain to our listeners, even though I have many questions about the Mandela effect itself, can you explain to them what is the Mandela effect? Okay, it's, it's a situation where groups of people, could be a few people or hundreds or thousands of people, have a very clear definite distinctive memory of the way something used to be but there's no longer any official historical proof that it would be that way except for other people who also do remember it used to be that way this could involve anything from geography to anatomy to brands and logos and products buildings streets houses you name it pretty much anything including where we are in the solar system, just everything, anything and everything can and will change, which doesn't make sense according to the way that most of us have studied science, at least in the United States of America and Western Europe currently. Nevertheless, people are experiencing things like, I've mentioned a couple of big ones people are often saying, yeah, that one hits me. <laughs> um, it would be something like the children's book, if you know Berenstain Bears from yeah, you know, as I read <laughs> each of your examples in the book, I had to, you know, from uh, 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 Captain Kirk to, you know, television show things to the think. I, and, and then I said to my husband, I said, so how is that famous statue of the thinker? Where does he have the? So I was starting to question all these things that I was reading in your book, because some of them, like who's dead and who isn't dead, some of those yes. things really rang home for me. And I thought, is this what she means by the Mandela effect? Was I one of yes. those thousands of people who also thought this at the same time? Yes. I, I, I think, could, could we talk a little bit about the, the, the background, how this first came about with this woman, Fiona Broom, and the she art popularized show? It. Yeah, she popularized it. I think Art Bell deserves credit for being the first media personality to really start getting the word out. I want to give credit where credit's due. Um, mm -hmm. I've been tracking the phenomenon since the 1990s, and I had a book in Spiral Bound called Reality Shifts that later came out in paperback. And so I, I, I was talking about the actor Larry Hagman being alive again. And I've met a few other people that noticed he died and he was alive again. But usually he wasn't a big deal, not as big as Nelson Mandela. So Fiona Broom went to a conference, um, I forget which one it was, Comic, not Comic-Con, well, some conference with sci-fi and so forth. And she was talking with people who may have, some of them might have heard the Art Bell conversations on Coast to Coast, talking about well, what's going on with Nelson Mandela. Didn't he die? And why is he alive again? <laughs> you know, does anybody else remember this? So Art Bell was getting the faxes, but it didn't catch on as the term Mandela effect until... Fiona Broom, uh, I think she coined that expression. She'd been tracking other kinds of paranormal phenomena. And so for her, this was just another interesting topic. She thought it was fun when people were originally sharing theories as to what's going on, examples of other things that were changing. And she was keeping, she had, had a website about Mandela effects that she kept uh, welcoming new stories for a while, but then it started getting a little overwhelming. So she kind of turned off the data gathering part. I've been collecting these stories consistently since the 1990s. I never stopped. And I do, um, you know, what do you call it? I'm a custodian for them. So I am I vet them. And so they they come through me. And then I, I go back and forth with the person telling me about the experience. Like, okay, where were you? What were you thinking? What was happening? Tell me more. So I draw more out of them than just them typing something in whatever version of English they're able to do. So I can get it cleaned up a little bit. But th these are people... Um, these are people who are experiencing this phenomenon all around the world. And so now this, um, 
when this experience was happening and Nelson Mandela is the name that was used to coin this, was he alive at that time to know about the Nelson Mandela effect or did he ever know anything about this or did this come about after he passed? That's a good question. It became really popular like in the early 2000s, like around 2007, 2009. And that's when he was still alive. And as far as I know, nobody contacted him to say, did, you know, hey, dude, did you know some people think he died? <laughs> it's a little awkward. But people have said, said that to me, if you've read my book on the chapter with things that happened to me, he did say that to me. And I thought, cool, check into that. You know, what do you remember? So I was able to ferret out um, and discover that, that, that there was a dovetailing of a time that I did have pneumonia almost died and still did notice that I had passed away in some realities. So that is really interesting. I I have to say, I remember, there were two that I remember and I wanted to ask you, because like you were writing that this has nothing to do with um, the memory situation. This has nothing to do with that. And I, I kept saying, wait, but it sounds like it does. What I got to ask her, there was two instances, the Larry Hagman one, and I remember thinking he was dead also. Oh, and yeah. then there was the, and actually we became friends. So I, I have to yeah. add that. Yeah. And then there was the Timothy Leary one that mm -hmm. also I thought he was dead when I was a teenager. I ended up sitting in his living room in Beverly Hills years later as well. And um, Larry Hagman made lunch for me at his house and we had yeah. a spiritual relationship. So I would write him all my spiritual uh, experiences and then he would write back his feedback on the spiritual experiences. And then I had cancer and he had cancer and there was the liver trans. So all this was going on. Yes. After uh, that, that's, <laughs> see the liver transplant. That's if you want a time marker, that was right around the time in, it was really sad. I didn't want Larry Hagman to die. I didn't know him like you did, but that's, that was the, when he died the first time. And I, I was devastated. I I don't know why. It wasn't, it's not like I knew him, but I felt terrible about it. And then it was just so confusing when he was alive again. That was one of the first ones for me. And that was, um, so he, when was that liver thing? That was the late 1980s or something. Um, it was before 1990. I don't right. remember exactly, but it was shocking. And so we don't have the Hagman effect. If there were more people like you and me, this would be the Hagman effect. Wow. So we've got the Mandela effect, which is cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, because I just wondered about how things go, you know, because here the Moody Blues is writing a song, Timothy Leary's dead, J.R. Ewing is shot, and nobody knows, you know, he, you know, there's a whole thing on, is he, is he alive, is he alive? And I just wondered if any of that got confused in people's minds, and that's why these things came about. But then I started to read numerous stories about Mandela effect, and said, yes. oh, no, this is not a one-time incident from uh, no. this memory. Right, right. Yeah, so. and this is what's interesting is to, to, in the book, I'm encouraging people to start trusting memory instead, because we have a tendency if we think, well, I remember it differently, I must be wrong. It's a human thing. We just think, I, I guess, I don't know what I was doing, just confused. What if you're not confused? And what if you pair notes with someone else? And for example, the Fruit of Loom logo is exactly what you both remember. So the fruit, is it, okay, it's fruit, a grouping of fruit um, together, but are they on, on a plate or in a bowl or in a basket or what kind of thing might they be in? And why would people suddenly remember the same thing when the historical version is no container whatsoever? <laughs> the bear and stay bear one. I mean, how yes. many... I have three children. They all got read that book. And yes. I'm reading that it's a different writing of the the name. And yes. I kept thinking, that can't be true. You know, <laughs> but <laughs> I always thought it was the, the other writing, not AI. I thought it was EIN. Berenstein or Berenstein. Yeah. Yes. Right, right. That's so like that too. That's a, is that like a, a simple way of describing a Mandela effect? So yeah, I call, I call it a mismatched memory, but I would trust the memories. And then because I go, I delve into the quantum aspect of things, we do have quantum science to explain a little bit, at least, of why we might see something that physicists would call a superposition of states where you might be aware, you might have dual memories, actually. You might be kind of really confused, like, 
whoa, this is trippy. I sort of remember it both ways. I've had that happen on some of these. Mm -hmm. um, or you, we might see flip-flops where the um, the thinker statue, maybe he's got his fist on his forehead one minute, or no, it feels like one minute. <laughs> one time you look at it. The next time you look at it, then he's got his fist here. Yeah. And now it's kind of like chewing on the knuckles or something. Like, what's with that? Why? What's going on? But to, when you trust your memories, then you know that you can be right. Um, it's you're you're in the realm of quantum logic, and in the realm of subjective experience, where there may not be such a thing as an objective reality. Now that's a paper George Weissman and I co-authored and presented at a conference uh, when we were focusing on the uh, hippies who saved physics. You know the as mentioned in the book by that same title. So we had a great conference there with Jack Sarfati and um, you know and George Weissman, of course, and many others. But, but the, the thing that George and I were talking about and writing about is that the subjective experience is key. And in quantum physics, it looks like that is the one thing we know for sure. Objectivity is like an illusion. I mean, when objectivity comes in, when we think there's true and false for everyone, we tend to think that there's one objective truth for everyone. What if there isn't? What if you can see a miracle, you can see a perfect healing, and someone else might not see that. They see something else. And this gets very interesting because it gets into some of the practices and the teachings when we learn the way to become a shaman. You know, it's a mindset. It's well, you could probably speak to this. It's pretty interesting because you've had some amazing training. Could you share your? I loved. I thought that was a very interest. I loved. Gave me great understanding when you spoke about your family dog, and yes. you and your family and how you related with this dog experience. Can you share that story? Sure. Yes. Okay. Well, it all started um, many years ago when the dog was still alive. He's passed away now. It's been a while. But when he was alive, he was a, he looked like kind of a, if you wonder what kind of dog was it? Furry, very long fur, like a Belgian turberin sort of, but he, we got him at the pound. So we don't know what species he, or what, not species, breed he was. He was definitely a dog, but um, very beloved. One day as he was getting up in years, maybe he was nine or 10, I don't remember exactly, but he was just getting elderly, a little white in the fur and, you know, long in tooth. He started getting um, cloudy eyes. So it looked to me like he was developing cataracts. And I just, my heart just cried, no. And I thought, okay. And I realized that sometimes things can look a certain way, but when you bring enough love to it, all the stuff we're talking about today, you know, we bring in the white light, you get to that frequency, you know, just like think you're back in that heaven range of that feeling of super amazing energy. I've just brought so much love to him. I picture him with clear eyes and his eyes were fine. It was good until one few days later, my daughter says, um, mom, you know, something's wrong with the dog. And I said, oh, his eyes. She said, yes. I said, it looks like they're cloudy. She said, yes. I said, okay, here's what we do. Now, this is a magical household, clearly. So I just yes. explained. Like, yeah, it looks like that. I know it looks like that. Well, what we're going to do is that's not acceptable. She's like, right. Like, okay. So we feel how much we love. His name was Prince Moonshadow. <laughs> we feel, she named him when she was really little. <laughs> we feel how much we love Prince Moonshadow and just feel all that love. Picture his eyes clear and they'll be clear again. And so that worked fine. Then a few days later, this sounds like a fairy tale, but it's real. I swear. <laughs> a few days later, my husband comes to me. Bad news about the dog. And I'm like, oh, his eyes really. He's like, yes. <laughs> and I'm just all jovial. He, he can't understand it. Like, oh yeah, I know it looks like that. We, we've been through this. I've seen that. My daughter's seen that. Now, I just explained again, here's what we do. Yeah, we see that. But obviously we love Prince Moonshadow. We know his eyes need to be clear. We just feel how much we love him and then it's clear. So we locked that reality in for all three of us. That's three subjective realities intersecting. I mean, for me, the physicist looking at that, that's like, oh, cool. We did it. Oh, well, I'm just saying it's the combination of the love, the healing, and the intention. And I thought that was an incredible example because it's not something, you know, the white cloudiness of the eye. It's right there looking in front of you, and then it's gone. Yes. Now, would that be considered a Mandela effect type experience? I think that these definitely are 
definitely connected. I've been calling these things reality shifts since the 1990s. And that was the first book I wrote, Reality Shifts, When Consciousness Changes the Physical World. That's where I mentioned Larry Hagman died and then he was alive again. Also, my roommate's cat died and then the cat was alive again. So two alive again stories in that one book. And so that's a huge part of this phenomenon for sure. When yeah. people say, well, that's a bizarre one. No, it's standard. We've been noticing this for a long time. I think with celebrities, but it wasn't being tracked this way. So now finally, we've got some terminology, whether you call it alive again or reality shift, Mandela effect. Yes, yes, these are connected because it's one day you've got something where the history was one way and now there's no proof it ever was that way. So is there a, a personality type or type of person who's most likely to experience the Mandela effect? Absolutely. Yes. Um, we've been, um, you say we, because I conducted some surveys and then Dr. Taryn Lupo did some research also. And I'd like to include Dr. Bernard Beitman. So three of us have done different kinds of research that all dovetail showing the same similar thing. And I love it when that happens. What they're showing is, um, in my case, I was doing a survey of, with people to self-report their Myers-Briggs personality type. There are 16 different variations. So you might be an introvert or an extrovert. I'm an introvert. I think you're an extrovert, but I yes. don't know. <laughs> okay. Well, the next one is intuitive, which I'm intuitive. I think you are too. Mm -hmm. So I'm an IN. I think you're an E. And then I'm feeling. So it's INF. The other was sensing. I don't know what you are. Could be either one. I know. I think you're an EN something. We could take a test and find out. Mm -hmm. The last judging or perceiving. And I am an INFA. And here's what's interesting. When you look at the middle two, the NF, that's the empath. The NF is a certain kind of empathic personality. And Bernard Beitman is tracking that for when he looks at meaningful coincidences. He's a psychology professor. He's written articles for Psychology Today. I had him on my podcast. He's brilliant. And so he looks at the way synchronicity happens for people who, he calls them coinciders. And he says that they are seekers. They understand there's something greater than they are. They are kind of looking at things a little bit outside of themselves. And to me, that's what the empaths are doing. We know our own subjective experience, but we see things, we're capable of seeing it outside of our own subjective experience. So it's, um, when, when I think of mathematics like calculus, um, it's like looking at levels of um, consciousness. And I want to give credit to the great philosopher, uh, what's, sorry, uh, what's, well, I'm thinking of Nicholas Rescher. He's another great philosopher. He's a living one in his 80s right now. But the one I'm thinking of is the inventor of calculus along with Sir Isaac Newton. So it's um, Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz. And he he really understood consciousness as being a factor of looking at your perceptions. So if something were to land on my hand like a butterfly, then the first order of perception is the it touches my fingers. The second order is noticing I something landed on my hand. So it's my hand, my fingers, that's a butterfly. So there are levels of conscious agency involved. There's consciousness. So that's what is happening now with artificial intelligence and robots and all that. They're trying to, well, they're they're succeeding at engaging levels of conscious agency in that way. A whole other subject. Obviously, I'm well, I'm not a transhumanist. <laughs> Let's put it that way. I, I love nature. I believe humans have um just nature given creator given gifts that are equal and i think um i think they're superior to anything that we would artificially create and think that that's going to be better i'd say no that's a whole other subject anyway uh, i uh, uh i have a second question here for us which is which historical figures have experienced the mandela effect I've read about them in your book, but yes. Oh, wow. Yes, yes. Well, for sure. I would say Carl Jung gets credit for being one of the early ones. And wow, what a guy to have experienced this. Um, he went to Italy to to see the Basilica at Ravenna, Italy with his friend, Tony Wolf. And while he was there, he was um, just in a beautiful space with blue lighting and huge mosaics that were six by eight feet. And I think there were a whole bunch of them, like uh, four of them or just a bunch of them in this octagonal room. Yeah, I think there were four. They depicted various water passages like Moses parting the Red Sea and Jesus being baptized, that kind of thing. And so he was talking with Tony Wolf about it. I, I know I'm going on about this and you may wonder, why does this matter? It matters because 
later when he thought, I should have gotten a postcard. I think I should ask a friend when they go to Ravenna, Italy, could you pick up a postcard? So he's asking his friends, you know, could you do this for me? And they report back, we don't know what you're talking about. We tried to find this building with the mosaics. There is no such thing. There are no mosaics. And, and Carl's like, wait a minute, what? I was looking at them and I was there with Tony Wolf. And so he talked about it with her. He would bring this up when he gave talks sometimes. And his friend, Tony Wolf, she also remembered it. So he totally gets credit for that. He didn't call it the Mandela effect, of course, because Nelson Mandela was not involved. <laughs> it might've been the Ravenna effect or the Basilica. But for Carl, yeah, Carl looks at consciousness. He took it seriously. He talked about it. He wrote about it. So was it, is it that the person is in two realities at one time or in a, is it different levels of consciousness or is it, was it a lifetime he remembered being there or there's so many. Yeah. He thought it was a real experience. So he mm -hmm. talks about it. Like it was real. Tony was there. It was real for her. They shared it. This is why I qualified as a Mandela effect because you've got more than one experiencer. So you've got mm -hmm. someone to trade notes with and they're both, you're both agreeing that was real. That was there. And then suddenly it's not. So it was a, Poser. It was a puzzler for Carl Jung. I think he was still kind of processing that. That's a big one. It would have helped him to have other people to talk about it with who might have had a similar experiences. So then you can develop the theory a little further. Um, but he was starting a first pass on it, definitely, and looking at the way that there may be, because um, of course, he's the one that gave us the archetypal um, psychological personas and I think he was looking at it from that standpoint, like what's going on. There's some, I think in his way, he, I, I tend to talk about levels of conscious agency where we can co collectively come together. I see that a lot. And I think he was coming along similar lines of reasoning. And totally on a different plane than him, you write a lot of mentioning about Philip K. Dick, the science yes. fiction author. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about him Yes. I have a few, my husband, that's one of his favorite authors. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, because he, people might not know who is that guy, but if you've seen movies like Minority Report, and I guess on, there's The Man in the High Castle, it's a current series that, based on his writings, um, what are some of the other ones? Uh, um, Harrison Ford was in one, I can't remember the name of that one. It's, um, oh, just so many great movies, really great. And often they come from short stories. So Philip K. Dick, he gave a speech in France, in Metz, France, where he was talking about the idea that you might just one day walk into a room in your house and go to flip the light switch on, something you've done every day for years, and it's not where the switch plate used to be. You're using a motor muscle memory, and that light is not there. He's talking about the Mandela effect straight out. I mean, that is it. He's describing it. That's exactly the kind of thing I talked about in my book, Reality Shifts, where I went to turn, I was running a load of laundry and my hand habitually was going to do the thing on the dial it does for the dryer, but it didn't work. And I'm like, what is going on? It was exactly what he's talking about. No longer did the dial operate the way it used to. And I had not been using any other machine. It was extremely disorienting. Um, but I was working on a book at the time about the subject. So it was like, well, here's one. <laughs> I kept running. <laughs> I kept experiencing different variations. So Clearly, um, and Philip K. Dick, he's talking, the name of the speech, I got to say that, the name of the talk was, if you think this world is bad, you should see some of the others. Mm -hmm. And so the idea was, sometimes we look at the news and we think this is terrible. And even back in the 70s, when he gave the talk, he was thinking that it looked like Roman times. And he thought that um, the powers that be in the U.S. government were repressive just like the Roman, um, you know, soldiers. And he felt like the people were under the thumb of that much too much. I don't think he'd like what he sees now, but he sure did forecast a lot of it. So um, very, very interesting that Philip K. Dick is involved in that. And he seems very savvy and very, I, I tend to talk about dead people like they're alive. He's not dead to me. Love Philip K. Dick. So he also had once met his future self. That happened to me too. So I think, some of these consciousness, these uh, consciousness cosmonauts, th those of us who like to explore it, see like, where does it go? This is not with drugs. I'm not doing drugs to experience these things. It's just possible for 
for us to have these out there experiences. And I, I think we can learn a lot from Philip K. Dick and, and the positivity, even though he wasn't really a positive person, but I like the way he said, if you should see, if you think this world is bad, you can see some of the others. I think that's similar to when I ask, how good can it get? It's like, okay, it was a little depressive perhaps, but we're, we're in the same place here. Like, yeah, this is pretty good and we can make it better. So this, this is a simple thing you talked about that I can relate to very much, which is uh, always getting a parking space when you need a parking space. Um, the other one, which I've been thinking about a lot from doing experiments, when I started doing experiments for Russell Targ and Dean Radin, I started to learn that time was not how I thought it was. And time is not, somehow, I've had this experience of playing with time and driving in a car, knowing I, it's from my door in Sebastopol all the way to um, uh, uh, Southern California. I can't remember on the water there down in Southern California and um, getting there in like five hours, some insane amount of time that's not physically possible. It's just one incident I'm referring to, but there are many like this where I get in a car with friends or someone and they say, well, we're supposed to be in San Francisco at one o'clock and it's 1215 now. How are you possibly going to get us into the place by you know 45 minutes? And yeah. somehow like time like, stops or something. I don't know exactly what goes on, but we always arrive. I just say, just don't listen to that. Yeah, don't ignore even it. The clock no, that no. we're on a different time place and we're going to go on that one. Perfect. And that's what we do. And that's what we get there. And I've been doing that for years and years. The parking one I learned as a teenager during a mind dynamics course that, oh, yes. So is there something about positively projecting into your consciousness to affect the future outcome? So that is that part of the Mandela effect so that you see things in a positive way happening instead of in, say, a negative way? Exactly. I think this is related. And when you look at the theories, I have a chapter on all the different possible, like what's going on, what's causing it. Some of them that I like are involving, like the life is like a dream. It's Maya. It's an illusion. Some people call it um, a simulation. I don't, I personally don't like to ascribe anything to a mechanistic creator for us. So I'm going to lean against that. I'm going to go with dream. You know, I, I'm going to go the, the shamanic approach pretty much every chance I get let's not get into that but <laughs> we'll just say reasons i think anybody that pays close attention would see well let's not I could really launch off on that let's not go there okay but yes people really do notice that they can um, bend time as one of the the first and most frequent reports that i get when people share firsthand reports of reality shifts they'll say cynthia this is the weirdest thing it was should have been a 12-hour drive we got there in six my friends thought i'd I was speeding. I swear I was not speeding. I was the speed limit the whole time. You know, my wife fell asleep. I was just driving, but is it not possible? How did this happen? And I can just reassure them, well, I don't know how it happens, but it does happen a lot. It's a, one of the most common types of reality shifts, or I would call it a Mandela effect. It happens. It's very, it's almost predictable in the sense that if you get into that good groove and just don't, don't worry about what it looks like. Don't get excited or anxious about the clock. Mm -hmm. I think this is an advice to humanity in general, because it feels like we're learning. We're in the sandbox, the play box, and we're playing with reality. Like, how can we do this without panicking and getting anxious and nervous? So we get to practice for getting a parking spot or arriving on time when there's no way that could ever be the case. But it is. We're there on time. So is Mandela Effect and Reality Shifts, both two different books you've written about, but yes. yet they cross over? They do. All my books cross over. I've been, spoke, I've been just laser locked on this topic. Um, mm -hmm. I even have a book, Aura Advantage, but it's about the energy field. And guess what? It's really about mind-matter interaction. They're all about mind-matter interaction. Um, even my children <laughs> book, even the book about money, it's all mind-matter interaction. So there are, you can look at it and slice it different ways and say like, well, this is different. And they're, they're, the difference with the Mandela Effects book that just came out is and i've written this one hoping it could be like a textbook actually like it can be a reference book for people so when they want to know like the physics is here 
that means we have it internally. We are capable of doing all these things, um, you know, that might seem impossible. Collectively, I know that we can, we can transform the world just with our thoughts and prayers, which sounds crazy, not to you, but I know a lot of people laugh at it. They say that's just, you know, ridiculous. I don't think it's ridiculous. And that's why I love Dean Radin's research. I mean, I, one of I, the many love, I loved your, um, I had never heard about that. I don't remember. I'm not good at, my memory is kind of going a lot lately, but uh, it was about India. I don't know if it was 2010 or something where you said millions of people were all meditating at the same time. And yes. that even, you know, it wasn't only India, there were other places in the world and there was a really positive energetic effect from that. Can you just tell our listeners a little about that? Yeah, I don't remember all the details right now either, but I um, it was one of many such experiments. I think that was one of the biggest and I can't, I'm sorry, I don't know the exact date or the places of the players, but I love those experiments. They're, they, they're constantly going on. There's another one that just is taking place, I think, currently. And uh, let's see who's doing that one. Lynn McTaggart. I think she's running some to calm down the chaos, um, psychic chaos related to this election year. So that regardless what happens, people can just be sane and rational and, yes. and respectful and connected with one another instead of, um, you know, what could happen otherwise. So that's very current. But these big experiments that have happened have been quite noteworthy, and they've they've left um, evidence in the form of some of the um, random number generators that are left running, like Pair Research Institute. They've got the Princeton Energetic. What does it stand for? P E A. -R. Roger Nelson. Roger Nelson. Does, yes. He has the global. I think global yes. consciousness. Or yes, and you can totally see effects there. So when. Uh, you can see it in the negative direction if there's a crisis, and sometimes you can see indicators beforehand, of course. Um, but when we're doing this intentional prayer and calming effect uh, for people that are bringing millions together, you can see that show up in these random number generator devices that are placed all around the world as well. So it's quite reproducible, quite amazing. Um, there was one other one, and then I'll get to the last couple of questions here we're coming up on an hour shortly but uh I was trying to understand reading about when you wrote about the anatomy shift and I kept I kept convincing myself I have to ask her does she mean the heart actually moved or the kidneys are in a different I didn't understand like because anatomy is something they can look at it in x-ray or a ultrasound yeah. or something so what could you explain exactly what went on with that okay well there have been several of the physiological and anatomical shifts that have occurred these mandela effects including bodily organs across the entire species of the you know, homo sapiens the, the human being it's happened across the board and the kind of things that are changing involve the heart position that some of us i remember being taught in grade school when doing the yeah the pledge of allegiance right but children put your hand over your heart it's not the center of your chest it's a little to the left it was a teaching moment for the teachers of course like oh okay and then that would match up if i went to have my blood pressure taken at the doctor's office it would make sure to take it on the left side of the chest um, or the left arm because that's going to get an accurate reading right arm might not be so strong so oh okay so I, there would be lots of corroborating evidence along the way that that was apparently the way it was. I didn't dissect people, so I didn't look inside bodies. I don't have that kind of proof. I don't really remember. I don't think I was studying an anatomy books too mm -hmm. closely. I vaguely remember seeing the heart was on the left side of the chest. Like, yeah, it looked the way I'd expect it. That's no longer the case in any anatomical textbooks. The heart is now dead, well, live center, say live center, in the center of the chest. And so it's not to the left, not to the right. It's pretty much balanced. But I think an even better example for people to understand what it feels like when this happens and when you get real proof. There, there's a woman that came to a talk and a workshop I gave in San Jose. And she was listening to me talk about the kidneys moving. And she'd been, she, I think she was the daughter of the minister that was working in the space we were renting. So she'd been kind of coming and going, but then she got huge saucer shaped eyes. She sat down and she's listening when I'm talking about the kidneys. And then she raised her hand and said, Cynthia, I got to say something because she said, I remember that what's happened with the kidneys and that I, what, what was I talking about? 
they have moved upward. Um, some of us remember the kidney punch. If um, someone was engaged in a boxing or martial arts event, was a potentially lethal strike. So caution is advised. In fact, it's an illegal strike to strike someone in the lower back where the kidneys used to be. I say used to be because they're not there now. They've moved forward under the relative safety of the rib cage, and they can now more easily be uh, reached from the front. And that's what was riveting her attention. She said, Cynthia, I have kidney issues. I go in for regular checkups. Doctors, they surgically reach in to check to see how things are going. She said, last time I, I came in, they did something di that they'd never done before. I said, what are you doing? And they said, we're looking at your kidneys. And she said, don't we go in the back? What, what, what are you doing? And they said, no, we always do it this way. She said, that's not the way they'd ever checked it before. Ever. And that's what it, it just, she was like white as a sheet. She was kind of, and kind of shaking. It was just, it was registering with her that this is not her imagination. Because it had really freaked her out, but she thought maybe I'm wrong. It was that weird feeling like, how could I have gotten that so mixed up? What happened? <laughs> and, then I, and then I'm talking about it. She's like, oh my gosh, this is real. Like, yeah, this is real. So when it hits you like that, it's really weird. Um, so that's what it feels like if you're caught up in something like that. But for most of us, it's a little esoteric unless you're medically involved. Um, and in that case, you might think it always has been the way it is now due to something called the quantum Zeno effect, where you can lock a quantum system at place Mm -hmm. by, uh, by virtue of frequent observation. Oof. I know. Well, uh, I've read many of personal Mandela effects that you describe in your book, The Mandela Effect and its Society. Which ones was the most surprising to you? If you can at least speak at least one or two, which ones like said, whoa, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, so if there are Mandela effects that other people would re recognize also, I think the kidney one is huge for me because I remember the kidney punch and like, well, that doesn't make sense now. You can't say it's a kidney punch. You can say it, but what does that mean when they've moved upward and they're kind of in the front now? This, the, the, what? <laughs> so that one is, those physiological ones really get me. Um, there are lots of product ones. We haven't talked about that much and they're kind of interesting. Um, like I remember Kit Kat had a hyphen. So it does or it doesn't? No, I'm I confused. remember it having I get, a hyphen also. Yeah, right. And yeah, things are just changing with the logos. I, I get seriously confused because I I've looked at it so much that now I it's like when you're a kindergarten teacher and kids spell badly. I, it's confusing to me now because I um, I've been looking at them a little bit too much. I, th I think the movie ones and the song ones get me a lot where I, I'm used to singing a song a certain way, like um, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. No, not this neighborhood. It's like, no, a beautiful day in this neighborhood. I never sang it that way. So for me personally, I would sing along with it because I grew up with Mr. Rogers. My children watched Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. That's not the way the song used to go. And it may not register for a lot of people around the world but that one got me so it's where there's something that you would sing it or you would do it for me that dial the timer dial on my dryer that's a personal mandela effect that really got me because why is my hand trying to do something and I'm, I'm looking at like am i retarded no the thing is different like no how is that possible uh, clearly it changed but i didn't replace the dryer it was just suddenly it, it turns differently and there was wild Has avocado. Yes. Uh, oh, I know that. You, you, Island. Uh, how about you with the Has avocado? That you're saying it the right way. H a a s. That's the way I remember it. Me too. But now, yeah. Now it's only ever been H a s s. That's has. That sounds rude. I'm... The thing <laughs> is, I was a produce buyer. That was one of my first jobs, and I used to buy produce in San Francisco in the market when I was 18 years old. So I was mm. reading this and thinking, wait a minute, I bought hundreds of boxes of Haas avocados. How could I not know that this, anyway, so it just, it wasn't, it's something that I've looked at over and over and over again. And yeah. I was sure it was H-A-A-S, but so, I don't know what it is now. I have to go look. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's been Haas. And, and only when it's people like you and me 
handed the little device so we can type it in then we type what we like like oh, so we're going to put it back to what it should be or by accident you know <laughs> should be h-a-a-s i remember that so it's, it's like human so-called error but it's not an error that's the way it always was i i agree i uh, i had let's see oh we have time for i've got two yeah. two, two or three more questions I, you have enough time okay. Are we good? yeah sure yes okay this one was very interesting to me about because I, between all the different guests I've had in my podcast, I'm questioning a lot of things from having these amazing people that have opened up into me thoughts about interdimensional beings, about whether there's uh, other consciousnesses in other places. I've never thought that, I know that my body dies, but I've always felt consciousness lived on, lives on, whatever that consciousness of the, my body contained I'm uh, I'm not too sure about like if I have reincarnation, did I jump in in the next lifetime or some of these things? But the thing about consciousness, I'm just sure. I just have I can't. Ch nobody can change my mind that you can't kill consciousness. It, right. it lives on. So, do versions of us? I mean, I'm asking this because I'm really curious, and I'm not saying I don't believe it or I do. But do versions of us exist in parallel universes? Well, that's a tough one to um, answer definitively. I, it feels like there are different versions of me. I'll, I'll put it that way. I think I can only experience, I can express it like From what your I experience. experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like sometimes I'll wake up and I'll feel like, oh, this is a different version of me. Like everything feels, but it feels, it's me. I, I feel like my spirit's much bigger than fits in this body. L let's start there. So that's, if we start with that, then like, oh, okay, okay. Otherwise it's like, what are you talking about? Well, okay, so number one, I'm much bigger than fits in here. So of course, if you think of it that way, it's like rotating through a little bit. Um, and I think some of that definitely happens. And sometimes I've been able to access information that I should not have because I didn't train in it, but it's easy for me to access it as if there's a version of me that has studied it and knows it quite well which is a little bit like that moving everyone, everything everywhere all at once, you know, mm. if you saw that. Yeah. I so, didn't see that. Okay. It's, it's a modern movie from the last few years. It's fun. Mm. Um, but it's a little crazy. It's not, it's not what I call realistic, but it's, but it gets the idea across of um, with some mechanistic approaches. I, I don't, again, I don't think we need mechanistic approaches. This is natural. So we don't need, the kind of sci-fi devices that they put into movies where you need this device or this thing, this gimmick. No gimmicks are needed for us. I think humans are, we have what we need. I learned that with psychedelic drugs. I had taken them when I was a teenager in New York and that was in, you know, 1970. And uh, then after, I think when I was about 18 or something, I never had another psychedelic drug again. And then I don't know, 10 years ago or something, uh, my husband and I decided to do um, a little bit of some psychedelic and go out into my orchard. And what I learned in it was that from 18 to 50 something or whenever I did that, that I'd been having all these experiences that I didn't need any drug for to have in whether it was traveling or remote viewing or having dreams or seeing pre, having precognition or any of these multiple things. And that when I took the drug, I was immediately seeing the soul of my husband's deceased father and having a conversation with him and going off into depths about this and that. And when we finished, I said, Oh my God. I said, all the things that have been happening in my life have not been drug induced. I didn't need any drugs to have any of that type of mind expansion or opening experience. I'm not putting down any of the drugs and I know they're wonderful for, and people are doing amazing therapies and all this other stuff, but I loved learning that I could access these other realms or I don't know what we want to call the word uh, and not have to have any kind of drug inducing to do that. Right. So you're saying the same thing. I feel the same way about it. I think we have yeah. some of those natural, uh, like we have DMT, I guess, naturally in our bodies. So mm -hmm. it seems like we're gifted with what we need. We can dream, we can meditate, we can expand our awareness, work with breathing, very simple, powerful techniques that can help us um, in positive ways that 
and I feel like you do. Some people feel like, but I need the microdosing. Like, okay, right. I'm, I'm not saying anything about that, but right. I personally feel like I don't need it. Right, I it's too much for me. <laughs> <laughs> maybe you got primed also. It's like when it's a, a strong dose at a certain age, then it may be neurons that fire together, wire together, and maybe it primed you and it's kind of set the stage. I don't know. Well, question number five is multi. So okay. I'm going to read it, but you can answer it all in different <laughs> sections, which is why us? Why this? Why now? And where is the Mandela effect taking us? And is it happening in other places in the world? Yeah. Oh, good one. Yeah, I love this question. I, I, I don't think there's an accident that we're starting to hear this phrase that was new to you, Mandela effect, at this time. At the, you may think, well, why now? Well, it's a crazy time right now. I don't need to go into all of what just happened in the last few yeah. years. I don't want to um, get a strike on the channel or something. Let's just say <laughs> it's been quite interesting. You know, that whole, <laughs> the curse of may you live in interesting times. Well, we're living in interesting times, but I, I know we wanted to be here. And clearly to me, the Mandela effect is showing us um, it's showing us that things can change, but they're never, I've never seen them change in a hideous, nasty, horrible way that put us deeply into a much worse situation. I would therefore agree with Philip K. Dick, who said, if you think this world is bad, you should see some of the others. Exactly. It looks to me like we're being handed by the universe at this point of maturity, which I hope we've attained. And at this time when many of our wisdom traditions, the indigenous wisdom keepers have told us that there will be this time it was prophesied we're in it now and we're here we're in it we need some tools that we can look at the world even though it looks like it's falling apart like the dog with the cataracts and to say no we love this world it's going to be okay that it is and to me that's what the mandela left is showing us and little by little just noticing first like are we changing this together probably yes who's doing this we are i think you know why because we can and we need to recognize we're creators of this reality even and the connections that we have with each other this is where i the, as you know that when i get toward the end of the book i go deeply into the indigenous wisdom because that's the way forward it needs to be based on relationships like what zurich Bittar taught us um, I, I think that i'm just feeling so overwhelmed with the emotion right now okay yeah, I can just feel it. I feel like he's with us and that connection that we have that we don't lose. He's a powerful presence. So when, when I just think of someone, you know how that works, <laughs> like, whoa, mm -hmm. he's here. Okay. Yeah. So we know better than to make the mistakes of cutting ourselves off, of losing our heads, of trying to do some short version of I'm going to get what I need right now in a selfish way without really thinking about all of our relations and and even the future generations to come, the seven generations forward, and really feeling in our hearts what that means. So that's why now, that's why us, that's why this. It's um, it's our, it's like it's like our toolkit going forward to become the cosmic creators that we're destined to be. And we are mature enough to do it. We need to bring that wisdom from our heart forward, and let the heart lead, let the wisdom lead, uh, be the homo sapiens, the wise humans that we are. In this highly technological time where they're getting rid of everyone's jobs and replacing them with robots and even just a grocery shop now, you have to, you come in and, and they, they, you, they want you to check yourself out. You don't even get to relate to a person anymore. And uh, that's also the feeling I have about when I do shamanic things or I'm in, or I or I have shamans come to visit and we get in touch with that other the other worlds or the other and that world is doesn't feel like a dream to me at all those worlds feel as real as if not more than this body that I'm looking at right here on our screen together and those yeah go ahead I'm sorry yeah excited. No, I'm, I'm good well, those worlds create what we see. So when we feel into it, they that's what um, motivates us, inspires us. We can feel the presence of our ancestors, of our teachers like Zurich Bittar and uh, Ruth Inga that led the conference that you and I used to attend, Ruth Inga Hines. So they're with us, that we don't lose them. We keep that wisdom. Today, I was, um, there's my, my stepson was commenting like, oh, there's a monarch butterfly in the front yard. 
And he said, it's gone now. And he was shutting the front door. And I said, I'm going to go see it. And he, he looked at me like, you know, uh, you know, like, huh, it's left, he said. I said, yeah, it, it, I didn't. It's like, okay, let's not talk about this. It's obviously coming back. So I just sat down. And then he was a little surprised when a few minutes later, it came back into the yard, came straight to me, not once, but twice. So it came to me, and then it sort of went away. And then it came back again, you know, a few minutes later, and then it left again. And I, it's like, this is that, again, the nonverbal communication. And you know, the, the, the butterfly knows how much I love it. Like, I love you. And it feels that. So it comes from a yards away, um, another neighbor's house, a big distance. No problem. It's back. So that kind of connection is the basis for everything. And when you have those journeys with shamans and you you go into, to me, that's the real reality. That's an interdimensional, deeper state where you're talking about, look, I need the light, you know, bring me the light. And then it comes through because you've made that connection. That, that's when so I, beautiful. When I went to my first um, uh, cer peyote ceremony in very high elevation, around 10,000 feet, in Mexico, in the Sierra Madre Occidental, with at that time it was a very remote group of the Weecholes, the Santa Catarina group, and now it's all different. But this was back, you know, over thirty years ago, and I wasn't understanding because I was just learning, and my Spanish is just a little. But at the end of the five days of consuming peyote, you know, pretty much twenty four seven, the Peyoteros, which number about 30 or something like this, uh, they go into their uh, Kali way, which is the temple that the ceremony's been in for hundreds of years there. And they dream together. And yeah. the concept of dreaming together had never, until I saw this, it had never occurred to me. And I've been able to do this with my dear friend Julio, my Huicho friend, and I've never done that with anyone before where we dream together and we're having the same dream. Yeah. Well, that's how they pick who's going to be in charge for the next five years of the police department, who's going to be the governor, who's going to be the, the secretary or whatever the different positions are in the community, which is a very serious position you take and you don't get paid for it. You get picked by dream time. And yeah. the men are all sitting in, maybe some women, they're all sitting in this circle, in this dreamlike space after five days of ceremony, and the choices are made. And I found that to be, I had, I thought, wow, you know, this, it's not an election. <laughs> no. It's a dream time. And in Absolutely. the dream, they all come together with who should the people be? <laughs> and they're doing it together in the dream world. I thought that was fascinating that is so beautiful yes. well we, we, we i'm part of this international mandela effect conference and we were geographically um challenged in the sense that i'm on the west coast chris onatra is on the east coast in connecticut shane robinson is in where is he um he's in the mid center center of the united states and then jerry's in tennessee so we're split all over the place oklahoma that's what i was trying to think of. i don't even think of oklahoma that often sorry <laughs> we do we're clearly dreaming together because the, we are still able to pull these conferences together and it means so much to each of us we all share this vision that this is how we can go forward as humanity that this is the mandela effect is not some gimmick it's not some look oh that's weird it's mm -hmm. not some joke it's here for a reason it's here for us it's here for our path forward and it's here to playfully engage with us like Berenstein Bears, like what happened there? <laughs> and I know it bothers some people, but it's it's really playful. You know, to me, it seems like it's saying like, come on, do you notice anything? Are you ready to play? Would you like to reshape reality? Are there some things that look terrible? Well, don't worry how it looks. Just together, we're ready to change it. And I love to ask how good can it get? So <laughs> that's, that's beautiful. Now we can end here now. So I think that's a beautiful note to end on. But I'm wondering, I'm just reviewing to make sure I've asked all my questions, and I have. And um, I always just ask my guest if there's any words of wisdom or any upcoming conference or anything that they want to tell our listeners, uh, either sharing both or how anything else you'd like to say. 
Oh, thank you. Yeah, so I've been talking about that conference and there's a website you can go to for that one. It's not my website, although I do mention it. It would be imec.world. And our next in-person event will be in Nashville, Tennessee. That's November 7th through the 10th. It'll be three and a half days and it's worth it. It's the, the cost like $185 for three and a half days. We'll have lots of speakers and a workshop. These are, it's called Adventures in Consciousness and we'll have people who are experienced, seasoned, timeline jumpers. We'll also, of course, be talking about the Mandela effect. So it'll be a lot of fun. And if, if people sign up for the newsletter, imec.world, then you'll see the live stream events that we do every, pretty much every month. Uh, and those are fun. And it's, it's a great way to share with the community. So you can join in the chat in on YouTube and say things like, I, I remember it that way too. And it just feels good to have that community. So if you're new to the Mandela Effect, but this show is waking you up and making you feel like, what is going on? That's a great way to find us. And on YouTube, we're International Mandela Effect Conference. I know it's wordy. And I've got a YouTube channel. And then you mentioned my website. For me, the website realityshifters.com is the best way to get my newsletter, find out what I'm doing, and all the rest of it would actually be there too. And your YouTube channel is again... It's, I think, Cynthia Larson or Cynthia Sue Larson, probably. I, I should know better, and I don't, but um, it's there. <laughs> and the title, be... the title of the podcast, again, is? It, oh, that's Living the Quantum Dream, and it's on the Dream Vision 7 radio network, and that's a beautiful, beautiful group of people there, and it's wonderful. So that's a lot of fun. <laughs> that's wonderful. Well, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. I've really enjoyed visiting with you again. I know we met many, many years ago at the uh, International Conference on Shamanism and Alternative Modes of Healing, founded by Ruth Inga Hines, an amazing woman. And from her, so many people have entered my life from that conference, you being one of them as well. So I want to thank you for being here. I want to thank all the listeners for tuning in watching this would be our 81st show we come on every other wednesday this is uh three years now we've been on the podcast and uh, we look forward to hearing about your comments stories anything you have to say after you've listened to any of our shows so have a very wonderful wonderful week ahead and also remember to share your stories because stories can heal bye 